So that's the 28th of July, 2022. Time keeps passing inexorably. I've been on retreat for the last couple weeks, solitary retreat, coming down for the meal, just getting some alms food from the buffet table and walking back up and eating at my kuti, my dwelling place. And it's been hot. And even though I open my windows at night and seven or eight in the morning, it's a nice 68 to 72 degrees. And even with that, it's by two or 3 p.m. It'll, it would be about 85 degrees in my kuti. So practicing with heat. And it's unsatisfactory. So this is, you can think about, oh, what do I do about this heat? Maybe I can do something about it. Maybe I can get an air conditioner or find some way to make it not be this way. But that's actually beside the point and that's not, to think like that isn't practice. So if we think, if we're still thinking like that, we're not really practicing yet. So the mind of a practitioner doesn't think, how can I change things? But the mind of a practitioner thinks, so this is dukkha, this is dukkha, and then looking at it directly, wanting it to be different. So that's the mind of the practitioner. So it's like, well, this is just the way it is. Heat is like this. And yeah, that make, makes the mind tired. The mind was tired because of the heat. But then that's just the way it is. Okay, well, deal with it. Deal with this particular situation rather than stressing out about it or trying to change it or trying to come up with ways to somehow make it better. It's not that we don't ever change conditions or make things more comfortable, but in the moment, it's just like this. This is just the way it is and it doesn't have to be a problem. So finding ways, finding ways to practice with it, walking meditation. And then when the heat isn't a problem anymore, it's just, it's actually not that bad. The tension, the tension or the suffering, making a problem out of it is far worse than the heat itself, actually. So there's the external heat. The external heat is, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's an unpleasant feeling, but then the internal heat is actually far more unpleasant. And the clinging and wanting it to be otherwise, you know, far more unpleasant. But without that, it's, it's endurable, it's not that bad. So as we learn how to practice, then we, we, learn, we learn these tricks of the trade, how to hold the mind in this way. And Lumpur Sumedho calls this the way of non-suffering. The way of non-suffering. This is the best way to live. This is the best way we can live. And so being in solitude, this is also a practice that we do here. We, during this summer period, the Vasa period, we do these two-week solitary retreats, and now that I'm coming off retreat, then uh, Tanar Kito and Abirka Justin will be going on to two-week retreat. And for those who are new to this particular practice, you quickly learn that solitude is an acquired taste. It's not just that you go into solitude and bliss out, and it's just totally amazing. But, uh, it's an acquired taste to uh, learn how to do it. Because in solitude, it's a good reflection on not-self, like the chant we did this evening, the Anattalakana Sutta, the reflection on not-self. is how do, how do I act when there's nobody to see me? What do I, how do I meditate when there's nobody there with me, nobody watching? How do I use my time when it's just me? So it comes down to really learning how to do things because they're beneficial, not because anybody's watching us or anybody's going to praise or criticize us. You know, it's just us praising and criticizing ourselves. It's just us relating to ourselves. So how do we relate to ourselves? 
that's what we can learn from solitude. And it's good to cultivate solitude, even when we're not in retreat. We have the whole afternoon period. We have this hall. This hall is cool. This cool weather in this hall gives us incentive to practice meditation here in the afternoons when it's hot at our dwelling place. So we can come here into this cool hall and meditate. And we can sit. We can sit a lot. We can sit for many hours. It would be greatly beneficial if we can sit for many hours. So rather than getting caught in conversations, try to come to this cool hall where it's quiet and, and sit. Do some sitting practice. If the knees start to hurt, get up and go into the breezeway or find a private location and do some walking meditation. Once the walking meditation has been enough, you can come back here and do another sit. You can sit for half an hour per session, 45 minutes per session, or even an hour or longer per session, depending on our bodies, uh, where our bodies are at, and we don't have to sit on the floor. We can sit in a chair. We can sit on the benches at the back. So sitting a lot. Come to the monastery and make good use of the time. Sit a lot. Use this cool hall a lot, and we can get out of the hot weather. And walk. Walk a lot. You know, get away and do a lot of walking meditation. Get to know the walking meditation path would be greatly beneficial for our mind and for the heart. There can be a resistance to doing this kind of practice, sitting and walking meditation, because sometimes what we see in the mind and in the heart, we don't want to see what's there. Memories come up, difficult memories, difficult experiences. It's almost like a miniature type of death. We could have our whole life flash before our eyes in the meditation, but it's good. This is the process of purification. When there's emptiness or when we're not really seeking distraction or doing anything in particular, the mind is kind of like a vacuum and memories get sucked into it and the, the mind starts to look for something to land on. So this is, this is the reflection on developing wisdom, what we call panya. The mind is always landing somewhere. At no time is the mind not landing somewhere. Consciousness is always landing somewhere, even while we're asleep. 24 hours a day, consciousness is always landing somewhere. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, mind consciousness, and thoughts. So one of those six sense bases, the consciousness is always going out. One of those six, even in our dreams, it's going out the mind and it's landing on dream objects. This is just happening 24 hours a day. It's always happening. So that's why we have a meditation object. We give rise to a meditation object, either butho or the feeling of the breath at the nose or the stomach or wherever it's most prominent. We have to have some sort of anchor and we, we try to get our consciousness to land just in one place rather than jumping around so much. So we create an anchor so that that insight that consciousness is always landing somewhere, that's starting to develop panya, starting to develop wisdom and discernment, which is a cause for letting go and liberation. Panya. And we, we start to see, well, something is directing it. Something's directing the consciousness to go out the eye, out the ear, and so on. So what's directing it? And the Buddha's teaching says craving Tanha, craving and clinging, upadana, is, is directing it. But we can't see it, it's too subtle. It's very, very subtle, it's very quick. And so we need this quality of samadhi, mental steadiness, mental collectedness. We need this very strong steadiness and stability of heart and a flexibility and malleability of, of mind and heart to start to see these things. So to develop panya, we find we need samadhi, we need mental steadiness, normally translated as concentration, but it's more like the, the Thai translation is my preferred 
go-to translation for samadhi, and that's the steadiness or the firmly established mind. More like a heart, because it's, it's got the feeling quality, so it's the firmly established heart. But then to do that, we find we need the precepts, we need the sila, we need the virtue, the ethical conduct to develop the samadhi because we keep, the mind will keep going to our conduct, it'll keep going to things that we might regret from the past. So we find we need sila, we find we need the precepts and the ethical living, the morality. So this is where the path comes from. This is why it's in that order, sila, samadhi, panya. Because the panya is too subtle. It's quick and, and it, the mind jumps around. And so we need that. We need that steadiness that comes from the keeping of the precepts, especially long term. And the sila, the, the precepts, the, the eight precepts that you all took this evening, it's for the sake of non-remorse. Just clean, simple living for the sake of non-remorse. <clears throat> when there's non-remorse, then the mind is at ease. And when, when the mind is at ease, it can start to experience some happiness. And when the mind experiences happiness, then it can start to experience samadhi. So this is a natural progression of the teaching. The Buddha talks about this in, in many places in the suttas. This very natural progression of practice. So anybody who comes here and is very sincere and wanting to sincerely meditate, sincerely make progress along the path, generally how it goes is we come here and, and I myself no different when I first came here is just pounding away at the meditation object is, and uh, wanting to get the samadhi so sitting down boot ho boot ho boot ho <laughs> find that doesn't work <laughs> and get tied up in knots and end up really tense and upset upset at myself, upset at others. Because then the mind rebels, so it's out of balance. So then we think, well, maybe we need to just kind of not focus on the meditation object at all. And just kind of let the mind flit around wherever it's going to go to, and seeking whatever distraction it's going to seek, and then that doesn't work. We end up all we end up all spaced out and just kind of everything's just kind of vague and nebulous. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna sit here and everything's just gonna happen automatically. The path and fruit and the noble eightfold path's gonna arise and if I just sit here long enough, I don't really have to do anything. I just have to be I just have to be doing sitting meditation or be doing walking meditation. I don't have to hold the mind in any particular way. And then that doesn't work. So we find there needs to be this kind of balance. And sometimes there does need to be a bit more of the firming up or pressuring the mind on the meditation object. There does, it does need to be a bit more tense temporarily. Sometimes we need to pressure ourselves in that way and then sometimes we need to let off. And sometimes we can go into cruise control when the precepts are more well de developed, when the meditation gets more well-developed. We gain a little bit of insight into how to be at ease, how to follow the path of non-suffering. One, one little technique in meditation, this is kind of coming up for me during a retreat, and I was following a bit more of a free-form retreat. I wasn't doing a really strict schedule of sitting and walking meditation, because for me, as my responsibilities I have in the monastery here, it's just nice just to be on my own and cleaning my kuti and just doing some sweeping and doing these monk things, just getting out of the office and just being on my own. So that even, even just that is, was quite nice. But then sitting down to meditate and there's this reflection on 
just that space in the solitude reflection on, well, you know, once you develop some skill in meditation, how do you actually get the mind to settle? So it isn't just about waiting and it isn't just about doing nothing either. So there's this balance. There is the, uh, Lumpur Cha talked about the meditation as the mind is like a little bird. And when you meditate on the meditation object too intensely, it's like you're holding a little bird in your hand, and a little baby bird. And when you, when you just cr- squeeze it like in a tight fist, then it crushes it. And so that's like the, the mind is too tense. But if you just open your hand and then it just flies away, so you don't, and you don't have it anymore. So you hold it just tight enough that it can kind of stick its beak out your fingers and it can kind of move around a little bit and it's comfortable. It tr- kind of tries to get away at first, but then, then eventually it settles down and it just feels comfortable there. And so that's Lumpur Cha one way he taught how to meditate. So there's that image of the little bird in the hand. Something that was coming up for me as well was contentment. Just if we've ever had a good experience in meditation of peace and happiness arise, and then it it might not arise very often, but sometimes it does arise, then we can contemplate how did that actually come about so one, one thing to try to see in the meditation is how the mind is always looking forward. So that's bhava tanha, that's the tanha associated with becoming. Well, always looking forward, always looking at least slightly ahead, at least slightly into the future. So can we almost visually just bring that back and bring that back completely into the present? say, well, right, right now, just tell ourselves in the next time we meditate, tell ourselves just as an experiment, right now, in this moment, everything's absolutely okay. Everything's absolutely fine. And it's really okay right now. And when we tell ourselves that, then we might find that contentment starts to arise Right now, it's fine. Don't need to change anything. Don't need to adjust anything. Right now, right now, everything is okay. That person I was going to have an argument with or was going to talk to, I don't need to think about that right now. I can set that aside. That work I was going to do, I can set that aside. Everything is fine right now. The project I was going to do to make my kuti cooler and not 85 degrees in the middle of the day, I can set that aside. Everything's fine right now. Everything's really, truly, wonderfully okay right now in the moment. Find the mind starts to quiet down and, and we can be content just listening to the insects outside and listening to the wind and the trees. And there's just nothing to do, nowhere to go. That's one of the benefits of solitude. This can help to really recharge the mind and heart, and this is why I've always found these two-week retreats immensely beneficial. Sometimes we actually don't think we're getting results, and we are. We are getting results. So as we go through, sometimes difficult memories arise, sometimes things arise in the meditation, we can't control them. They're not self. Uh, Difficult or impure thoughts arise. We can't control them. But what we can do is we can call into question the identification with them, see it as just thought, rather than my thoughts, my problem, my defilement, my hindrance. See it as just a natural phenomenon. It has causes and conditions. It's something that The causes were planted perhaps even a long time ago for the thoughts arising now. I like to think of that as like this is like a purification of the heart, purification of the the mind, of the knowing. And 
this process of purification can be quite painful. It's like taking the heart. You can think of the heart as having like a dark, toxic crust on the outside of it. And the Dhamma is this potent, astringent medicine that we're dipping the heart into. And yes, it's going to suffer. Yes, it's going to be painful. But the process is one of healing. It's not ultimately harming us. It's the, the suffering of the practice is a process of healing, a process of purification. There's those two types of suffering, the suffering that leads to more suffering, so we would call that worldly suffering. Then there's the suffering of the practice, and that's the suffering leading to the ending of suffering. And we want to go into that. We want to dive into that. We don't want to run away from that. This being in solitude, when we do sitting and walking meditation in solitude, especially if we have many hours a day with no distractions, nothing to do, we do many hours of sitting and walking meditation. At a certain point, and maybe sooner, or maybe later, the mind is going to start to rebel and want to get away from the unpleasantness that we're feeling, the suffering that we're feeling, the difficult mental states that we're experiencing, the difficult memories that are coming up. At a certain point, we're going to want to escape from that, get away from that. Now, if we develop the heart of the samana, the mind of a practitioner, then the way is to go into it, to go into the suffering, to face it directly and look at it directly. What is this unpleasantness? What is this feeling? Why is my mind telling me that, well, I've meditated eight hours today already. That's you know, too much. I need to I need to go do something else now. So our mind thinks in terms of time. And, or we, we blame the suffering on some sort of external condition. But it's just, it's just the unsatisfactoriness that's built into samsara, built into the conditioned realm. So we look directly at that. And what is that? Where does it come from? Why does it have such a strong effect? We might be inclined to study more. Oh, I need to. I need to get. I need to study the suttas more. And this isn't to criticize studying at all, because studying on a daily basis can be quite good in a limited way. But we might be inclined to. Oh, maybe I need to do more study. Maybe that's why I'm suffering. But in the end, we're suffering because we haven't yet reached the end of suffering. Sometimes it's helpful to inspire ourselves reading the biographies of great Ajans, Lumpur Cha, or anybody who hasn't read Stillness Flowing, the biography of Lumpur Cha, highly recommended. And this can help us to tell ourselves, well, it actually is possible. It actually is possible with practice. But it's not easy. We're, we're going to have to go through suffering, we're going to have to go through difficulties this, in this journey of the practice. For some of us, we're going to have to go through bramble patches and, and experience pain to come out the other side. And it's very rare that somebody can practice and just have it be smooth sailing from beginning to end. Very, very rare. And, that, and sometimes, now that uh, this, is my, this is my 20th vasa as a bhikkhu, uh, and uh, now I, when I see the anagarkas and novices, and sometimes if I see them suffering, I think, I don't want them to suffer. I want them to be happy. What can I tell them? But then I think, there's just no way around it. <laughs> they, they have to suffer. <laughs> But it's hard, it's hard to see, but then I have to remember, oh, I, I had to go through that too. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. <laughs> In 20 years, you'll... <laughs> It'll be slightly better. <laughs> you 
It's good to re- it's good to recollect though that it does uh, the practice does work. Dhamma does work, <laughs> work, but it's it's not easy. It is worth it. The Lumpur Sumedho visited here for a month and a little over a month actually, and now he's at Tisarana Monastery in Canada, and. Uh, I really appreciated his month here, even though he didn't come out much, and it was really us just allowing him to be taking it easy. You know, he's 88 years old, and he's given so much to us, and really a Bayagiri is here because of Lumpur Sumedho. And, but uh, remember one day we got to go over as a Sangha and do some Q&A with Lumpur Sumedho over at Santi Vihara. And, uh, at the end, I, I hung back and we chatted, chatted personally for a bit. And Ajahn Chanda was there as well. And uh, Lumpur Sumedho was talking about some of his difficulties. And he's very, that's something I love about Lumpur Sumedho. He's very open about his, his own hindrances that he struggled with early on and his own suffering that he struggled with as a junior monk. And also, he's had so many struggles and difficulties as an abbot over the years. And, and I, I just said, oh, Long Paul, I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been for you. Because when I see Long Paul Sumedho, it's, it's like he's had, it, he's, he's had to go through more difficulties than anybody else I know in terms of like uh, being betrayed by friends and mistreated and <laughs> just... He's had all these really difficult experiences as a senior monk, even, and and uh, he just said, "Well, you can't you can't really think of it that way. You can't, and you can't make those things not happen. And when it happens, you just deal with it, and you go into it, and you deal with it." And he said it with no resentment, no sense of complaining, no sense of. It shouldn't have been that way. It just you can't make those things not happen. This is the nature of samsara. This is the nature of reality. So there was a he related a story where there was a particularly difficult period of time in the past at at Amaravati, and there was some disharmony in the community, and and uh, he had somebody who he was uh, having him and and. and uh, Another person in the community were having some difficulties, and Ajahn Sumedho saying eh, all these criticisms toward this person, and so he used a skillful means. He he wrote out all of the criticisms. He decided I'm going to write out all the criticisms of this person that I have in my mind, and and then and so he wrote out all the criticisms, and he filled three pages full of criticisms of this person, and then and then it was done. And he, and he couldn't think of any more criticisms. And then the next day he felt really good. He, he wasn't feeling critical at all um, toward, toward this person or toward anybody. He was feeling really good. And he thought, well, maybe, maybe when I see this person, I'm just going to say the first thing that comes to my mind. And I wonder what that's going to be. And then the first thing that came to his mind was the words, I love you. <laughs> And he's, he thought, what? That is weird. I wasn't expecting that to come in my mind. And, but it was this insight and about, and this is, this is where the practice gets interesting and subtle, is it's this insight that when, when all those other things are used up and you uncover, you take, you, you take the conditions off, what's there is just, is just metta, is goodwill, is just compassion. So it was, but it was just covered over. It was there before, but it was just covered over. So that's, that's one aspect of wisdom, is seeing that those good qualities are there, but they're just covered over. There's uh, purity is there, but it's covered over. So a lot of the process of the practice is just sweeping it aside, uncovering it. So that, that was just uh, one interaction with Lumpur Sumedho. It very deeply affected me and 
kind of rekindled this sense of really strong gratitude for Of course, Sumedho, as one of our Krupa Ajans, as one of our great teachers who we rely on here and, and uh, rely on his teachings. Sometimes it can get like, what are we doing here? What, what, what am I doing? This place, this monastery sitting here, I'm like, doesn't make any sense. And we can get into this state of like, what, what's going on? But really we're doing this so we can learn about the way of non-suffering and learn about the best way to live. So, uh, so today is the Wan Pra, the Lunar Observance Day, the new moon. And we have this opportunity to continue practicing. So uh, I think I will, that's probably good enough for this evening. I'll leave it there for tonight.